and, and many a disgusted sheep and cow. In the woefully dusty horseman in charge of the expedition, I recognized John Blank. Of all persons in the world to meet on top of the Rocky Mountains, thousands of miles from home, he was the last one I should have looked for. We were schoolboys together and warm friends for years, but a boyish prank of mine had disrupt, disrupted this friendship, and it had never been renewed. The act of which I speak was this. I had been accustomed to visit, occasionally, an editor whose room was in the third story of a building and overlooked the street. One day this editor gave me a watermelon, which I made preparations to, to devour on the spot, but chancing to look out of the window, I saw John standing directly under it, and an irresistible desire came upon me to drop the melon on his head, which I immediately did. I was the loser, for it spoiled the melon, and John never forgave me, and we dropped all intercourse and parted, but now met again under these circumstances. We recognized each other simultaneously, and hands were grasped as warmly as if no coldness had ever existed between us, and, knew, and no allusion was made to any. All animosities were buried and the simple fact of meeting a familiar face in that isolated spot so far from home was sufficient to make us forget all things but pleasant ones. And we parted again with sincere goodbyes and God bless you from both. We had been climbing up the long shoulders of the Rocky Mountains for many tedious hours. We started down them now and we went spinning away at a round rate Two. We left the snowy Wind River Mountains and Uinta Mountains behind and sped away, always through splendid scenery, but occasionally through long ranks of white skeletons of mules and oxen. Monuments of the huge immigration of other days, and here and there were upended boards or small, small piles of stones which the driver said marked the resting place of more precious remains. It was the loneliest land for a grave, a land given over to the coyote and the raven, which is but another name for desolation and utter solitude. On damp, murky nights, these scattered skeletons gave forth a soft, hideous glow like very faint spots of moonlight starring the vague desert. It was because of the phosphorus in the bones, but no scientific explanation could keep a body from shivering when he drifted by one of those ghostly lights and knew that a skull beheld it, and knew that a skull held it. At midnight it began to rain, and I never saw anything like it Indeed, I did not even see this, for it was too dark. We fastened down the curtains and even caulked them with clothing, but the rain streamed in in twenty places notwithstanding. There was no escape. If one moved his feet out of a stream, he brought his body under one, and if he moved his body, he caught one somewhere else. If he struggled out of the drenched back of his neck blankets and sat up, he was bound to get one down the back of his neck. Meantime, the stage was wandering about a plain with gapping gullies in it, for the driver could not see an inch before his face, nor keep the road, and the storm pelted so piteously that there was no keeping the horses still. With the first abatement, the conductor turned out with lanterns to look for the road, and the first dash he made was into a chasm about 14 feet deep, his lantern following like a meteor. As soon as he touched bottom, he sang out frantically, Don't come here! To which the driver, who was looking over the precipice where he had disappeared, replied with an injured air, Think I'm a damn fool? The conductor was more than an hour finding the road, a matter which showed us how far we had wandered and what chances we had been taking. He traced our wheel tracks to the imminent verge of danger, in two places, I have always been glad that we were not killed that night, 
I do not know any particular reason, but I have always been glad. In the morning, the tenth day out, we crossed Green River, a fine, large, limpid stream, stuck at it with the water just up to the top of our mail bed, and waited till extra chains were put on to haul us up the steep bank. But it was nice, cool water, and besides, it could not find any fresh place on us to wet. <laughs> at the Green River Station, we had breakfast, hot biscuits, fresh antelope steaks, and coffee. The only decent meal we tasted between the United States and Great Salt Lake City, and the only one we were ever really thankful for. Think of the monotonous excurableness of the 30 that went before it, to leave this one simple breakfast looming up in my memory like a shot tower after all these years have gone by. At 5 p.m. we reached Fort Bridger, 117 miles from the South Pass, and 1,025 miles from St. Joseph. 52 miles further on, near the head of Echo Canyon, we met 60 United States soldiers from Camp Floyd. The day before, they had fired upon 300 or 400 Indians, whom they suppo supposed gathered together for no good purpose. In the fight that had ensued, four Indians were captured and the main body chased four miles, but nobody killed. This looked like business. We had a notion to get out and join the 60 soldiers, but upon reflecting that there were 400 of the Indians, we concluded to go on and join the Indians. Echo Canyon is 20 miles long. It was like a long, smooth, narrow street with a gradual descending grade and shut in by enormous perpendicular walls of coarse conglomerate, 400 feet high in many places, and turreted like medieval castles. Thus, this was the most faultless piece of road in the mountains, and the driver said he would let his team out. He did, and if the Pacific Express trains whizzed through there now any faster than we did then in a stagecoach, I envy the passengers the exhilaration of it. We fairly seemed to pick up our wheels and fly, and the mail matter was lifted up free from everything and held in solution. I am not given to exaggeration, and when I say a thing, I mean it. However, time presses. At four in the afternoon, we arrived on the summit of Big Mountain, 15 miles from Salt Lake City, when all the world was glorified with the setting sun and the most stupendous panorama of mountain peaks yet encountered burst on our sight. We looked out upon this sublime spectacle from under the arch of a brilliant rainbow. Even the overland stage driver stopped his horses and gazed. Half an hour or an hour later we changed horses and took supper with a Mormon, destroying angel. Destroying angels, as I understood it, are Latter-day Saints who are set apart by the church to conduct permanent disappearances of obnoxious citizens. I had heard a deal about these Mormon destroying angels and the dark and bloody deeds they had done, and when I entered this one's house, I had my shudder already. But alas, for all our romances, he was nothing but a loud, profane, offensive old blackguard. He was murderous enough, possibly, to fill the bill of a destroyer, but would you have any kind of an angel devoid of dignity? Could you abide an angel in an unclean shirt and no suspenders? Could you respect an angel with a horse laugh and a swagger like a buccaneer? There were other blackguards present, comrades of this one, and there was one person that looked like a gentleman. Heber C. Kimball's son, tall and well-made, and 30 years old, perhaps, a lot, a lot of slatternly women flitted hither and thither in a hurry with coffee pots, plates of bread, and other appurtenances to supper, and these were said to be the wives of the angel, or some of them at least. And of course they were, for if they had been hired help, they would not have let an angel for, from above storm and swear at them as he did, let alone one from the place this one held from. This was our first experience of the Western peculiar institution, 
and it was not very prepossessing. We did not tarry long to observe it, but hurried on to the home of the Latter-day Saints, the stronghold of the prophets, the capital of the only absolute monarch in America, Great Salt Lake City. As the night closed in, we 